How great is our God? I think we could spend the rest of our time here just thinking and singing and talking about that, and we wouldn't run out of a single thing to say. Um, and I think Nehemiah would gladly join us as we, uh, in, that, in that sentiment. And the way that he wrote out this narrative, you can, you can see, you can just see in his words and the words that, are on, uh, that it pour out of him, uh, his declaration, how great God is. Uh, last week, we left off in the story of Nehemiah with a strong sense of the rising tension that has been building throughout this first chapter, chapter and a half, two chapters, as we lead towards the beginning of the physical building effort that starts in chapter 3. Today, or last week, we examined Nehemiah's experience as he was before King Artaxerxes, a pivotal moment that wasn't planned at all by Nehemiah, but as we saw last week, as Mike uh, taught us last week, that moment was clearly under the complete uh, control and sovereignty of God. In fact, this good hand of God that was with Nehemiah at that time is going to prove to be extremely significant and important in this latter portion of chapter 2 that we're going to take a look at today. His meeting with Artaxerxes had come at the end of a long and arduous period of prayer and fasting and mourning and weeping over the status of the people of the kingdom of Israel and their city, Jerusalem, which had been uh, destroyed and left in shambles. And Nehemiah, as we've learned in the last few teachings, you know, as a, was a member of this covenant people, God's covenant people, with which he had established his promise and had established this, the work to reconcile all things back to him. And Nehemiah, as we learned in the previous sermons, was mindful of his people, mindful of his home, but most importantly, mindful of the character and the word of his God. And that's going to be uh, proven out to be really, really important now that he's actually out there on the mission field. But when the report came in initially, Nehemiah truly listened. Uh, Mike challenged us when he opened us up in this study. He challenged us to ask ourselves, do we listen in the same way? He was truly concerned. And out of that listening and concern, he acted. And he acted boldly. We saw that from the very first action that Nehemiah took, entering into that period of prayer. He didn't just uh, add one bullet to his evening prayer list. He went all in with boldness before God and the way that he engaged God. And we saw that again when he was before Artaxerxes and the boldness with which he was able to stand and, and give his request to the king despite being terribly afraid in the presence of this powerful man by worldly standards. His bold actions, though, they weren't the result of you know, his own personal ambition. This is something really important to note about Nehemiah. In fact, it's really important to know, and this is kind of the first uh, foot stomper uh, for me is in the sermon, is that his bold actions were not founded in himself. They were founded in his bold faith in the promises of God. His bold actions were founded in his bold faith in the promises of God. In fact, as we look through the story of Nehemiah, we can discern a very simple but clear pattern uh, going on. It's a pattern that we can see very easily whenever God's people are acting in faithfulness and obedience to Him. And it's one that I could say that we probably all would desire to see in our own lives. And it's quite simply, God moves, and then Nehemiah faithfully responds, and then God moves again, and Nehemiah faithfully responds, and so on. But it's important to note that the timing and the method of God's movements isn't always uh, you know, seldom or seldom known ahead of time, if rarely at all. The clarity of which, you know, it, of those movements isn't always known uh, at all. But the faithfulness of Nehemiah that we see, you know, is the important part. He was faithful that God would move. He was faithful that God would hear his prayer. He was faithful that God would speak into the heart of Artaxerxes when he was addressing him with his request, and he's faithful yet again in the latter part of chapter 2 when he's at Jerusalem and engaging the people and the opposition there. So after praying and fasting and confessing and breaking before God, King, uh, and Nehemiah you know, had gone to Artaxerxes, he got the letters, he had gone 
uh, you know, he had actually stepped off, gone across the wire, uh, and, and gotten to the border regions around Jerusalem and presented those letters. And as Mike uh, finished off last week, let us know that he met the great, uh, the, the, the great displeasure of Sam Ballot and, and Tobiah. To me, that sounds like a logbook entry. I, I'm pretty sure it was probably a more colorful experience than that. But that's how he decided to put it together, the great displeasure. Uh, And then we pick up in verse 11, and I love this. I love the simplicity of it. He says, so I went to Jerusalem and was there three days. Now, there's an 800-mile, five-month-ish journey wrapped up into that verse, but it comes right after receiving the great displeasure of all the opposition being made clearly known to him, coming face-to-face with it for the very first time. And his next sentence is, So I went. Nehemiah arrived in the city with zero fanfare. This is completely countercultural to when somebody would, in this day, when somebody would come into a city with something to do, they would generally let people know about it. He intentionally did the opposite. He didn't draw attention to himself. And the people of Israel at this point had no idea that he was coming. And they had no idea what his purpose was. But it's interesting, at this point, the opposition did. They already knew that he was coming. They already knew, at least to a point, what his purpose was because he had shown up and delivered to them the letters from King Artaxerxes. And the thing that, I, that, that is important to me here is that although they knew that Nehemiah was coming, they'd be in the opposition, they didn't know the true why. They didn't know that Nehemiah was sent by God. They didn't know that Nehemiah was coming armed with God's plan. They didn't didn't know that Nehemiah wasn't coming with a plan that was founded in his own ambition and his own pride. They didn't know that Nehemiah wasn't coming to be yet another hero trying to come and rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. And that's going to be really important later on when we see how the opposition chose to act out uh, their displeasure. So then we go, we read in verse 12. Then I arose in the night, I and a few men with me, and I told no one what my God had put into my heart to do for Jerusalem. There was no animal with me, but the one on which I rode. So Nehemiah is continuing this low profile, covert style action by conducting his survey of the wall at night with as few resources as possible. Now, from a practical standpoint, this afforded Nehemiah a couple things. Three things. It afforded, it afforded him the ability to avoid the attention of the opposition. Secondly, it gave him the opportunity to avoid the premature attention of the people of Jerusalem. And thirdly, it allowed for him to conduct a, this survey in a focused manner. The ultimate goal, as we taught, as Mike uh, taught us earlier in the sermon series, the ultimate goal of Nehemiah's mission goes far beyond the rebuilding of a physical wall. The ultimate goal is the renewal and the restoration of God's people. And if Nehemiah had allowed himself, his pride, his ambition to get in the way, or if he had allowed himself to become easy prey for adversaries, or if he had allowed himself to be distracted or unfocused, in the conduct of his work, then he would have struggled greatly to, be, to, be an effect, to effectively support God's plan. This is important for us because as a believers, we want to be effective supporters of God's plan. God's plan. We want to be agents of change for God. We want to make, know Jesus and make him known. But we have to do that with the intentionality that comes with serving God and knowing that the opposition is there and knowing that there's distractions out there just ready and waiting to pull us away from our task. It goes on in verse 13 to describe uh, what it was he actually accomplished. He said, I went out by night by the valley gate to the dragon spring and to the dung gate, and I inspected the walls of Jerusalem that were broken down and its gates that had been destroyed by fire. Then I went on to the fountain gate and to the king's pool, but there was no room for the animal that was under me to even pass. Then I went up in the night by the valley and inspected the wall, and I turned back and entered by the valley gate and so returned. 
So if you're a map whiz, uh, this is accounting for the southerly portion of the city of Jerusalem. So Nehemiah went around and he kind of went counter, counterclockwise and got to a point where his, uh, the, the mount, the donkey, the horse, whatever it was that he was riding on, couldn't even make it through the rubble. It was that bad. And so he went back and, and came in the way that he had originally set out. And so he didn't make it to the northerly part of the, uh, of the wall. But we know by the, the manner in which he accounts for it that Nehemiah surveyed the wall with focus and intentionality. In fact, the word inspected or examined here is actually a medical term akin to examining a wound prior to treating it. He was not out there just stargazing or enjoying a peaceful moment. Now, I'm not, I'm not condoning either one of those. Or I'm not downing either one of those things. Uh, but we also, and you see it in the way that he records this, this reconnaissance of the wall uh, that he c- conducted, the detail with which he put it through. Compare that back to, you know, the generality that he gave to his 800-mile journey. Uh, here he actually goes into great detail. And it's true he didn't make it around the full perimeter of the night, and scholars have debated a couple of different reasons as to why that may be. Um, but ultimately we know that Nehemiah knew he needed to conduct this survey and see uh, the damage and see the ugliness of Jerusalem firsthand before he went and addressed the people of Israel. And this begs the question, you know, it shows us that Nehemiah was willing to do that. Now, we've seen Nehemiah was willing to pray, and we've seen Nehemiah was willing uh, to request uh, the, the letters and the permission from Artaxerxes, and we've seen Nehemiah was even willing to go. But now we see Nehemiah was willing to go and actually take a first-hand look at what the world didn't want to see at what the people who had been uh, exiled in Jerusalem for all these years didn't really want to uh, focus on. And it's, it's just an interesting point about Nehemiah. He went that extra, extra leg to take a look at what everybody else thought was beyond repair, what everybody else thought wasn't worth the time. And for us, I ask the same question. You know, are we willing, are we God's people willing to go and take a look and pay attention to the things that the world says isn't worth uh, paying attention to? Are we, are we willing to concern ourselves with what the world says? No, you don't need to concern yourself with that person. Forget about them. Uh, they're a lost cause. You know, uh, you know they, they're, they're never going to receive that love. They're never going to receive uh, that, that hand that you extend out to them. Right? We don't know that. That's not our position. And Nehemiah, he didn't, he didn't let that stop him at all. And so in verse 16, I'm going to get myself lost. In the officials, and the officials did not know where I had gone or what I was doing. And I had not yet told the Jews, the priests, the nobles, and the officials, and the rest who were to do the work. As we said before, uh, they didn't know he, that he was coming, and they didn't know why he had come. Nobody that was to do the work uh, knew what he'd been up to. And I kind of asked myself while I was going through in, in my study here, uh, I was like, what if they had? What if they had known ahead of time? And knowing what we know about people, there most likely would have been competition over what to do, how to do it, where to do it, uh, who's going to do it, who's going to pay for it. You know, it kind of sounds, if you've ever been in a planning meeting of any kind with a large group of people, that probably sounds familiar. But uh, this is, th- th- all this stuff, such nonsense that would have been totally contrary to the ultimate goal of unifying the people in faith and hope in God, which is his purpose. As the man whose heart God had laid upon the vision and responsibility to lead this task, Nehemiah did what he did to ensure that he would be able to follow through on God's plan. But now Nehemiah was ready. Now he was there. Now he would tell the people of Israel what he was doing and what he had come to do. So in verse 17, Then I said to them, You see the trouble we are in, how Jerusalem lies in ruins with its gates burned. Come, let us build the wall of Jerusalem that we may no longer suffer suffer derision and shame. And I told them of the hand of my God that had been upon me for good, and also of the words of the king that he had spoken to me. And then they said, Let us rise up and build. So they strengthened their hands, for the good work. Nehemiah 
This is, this is the moment. This is the, the transformational moment when the, the hearts of the people of Israel that have been so complacent for all these years, all these generations, now becomes focused on God, becomes focused on what God is doing and what He can do. And the question is, what made the difference? Nehemiah didn't lecture them on what they already knew, right? He said, you know what the problem is. But rather, he revealed to them what they were unaware of, what they had failed to observe, or what they had grown complacent in seeing. That was how God had moved, and how God was moving, and to become, or how God was remaining faithful to the terms of the covenant that He had set forth years and years ago with the, uh, the people of Israel. This is the covenant that David Sutherland taught us about uh, a couple weeks ago. This is the covenant that God said that He would never break with His people. And now the people who had gone so far and away from it had lost sight of the promises of their God. These are the promises upon which Nehemiah's faith was built. The promises with that faith was built upon and that he was therefore enabled to use to act boldly again here before the people of Israel. And now they've heard it, and they have responded uh, communally in faith and trust in their God upon hearing about Him moving. So now we have God moving, and not just Nehemiah, but all of the people of Israel uh, faithfully responding. For us today, it reminds us that the church isn't called to an us, them relationship. This is harkening back to when uh, you notice here, Nehemiah's language isn't, hey, I'm telling you this. Hey, I came to help or teach you how to build this wall. It's, it's we. He said, you see the trouble we are in. Come let us build the wall that we may no longer suffer derision. The church isn't called to an us, them relationship with those who need Jesus. The church isn't called to an us-them relationship with the communities that we're planted in or that we seek to plant in. We're called to be a part of it. This is another, like, akin to the Pharisees and, 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 and Christ, how the Pharisees wanted an us-them relationship with the people of Israel. But Christ walked with the people of Israel. He sat with sinners. He ate with sinners. He met them where they were. And he went out and became a part of the community and met them missionally, engaged with them uh, missionally before he ever tried uh, to give them lofty messages or anything like that. And Nehemiah does the same. But we'd be, uh, we'd be naive to, to ignore the fact that as God moves and Nehemiah and his people respond that the opposition isn't there. It would be a naive thought to think that this is just going to all go smoothly, sunshine and rainbows, and that nobody is going to stand up and try to do anything in opposition to God's work and God's people. Uh, You know, we talked about this last week uh, as well, and, and, and here it is again in verse 19 and 20. But when Sambalat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite servant and Geshem the Arab heard of it, they jeered at us and despised us and said, what is this thing that you are doing? Are you rebelling against the king? And then I replied to them, I, Nehemiah, replied to them, the God of heaven will make us prosper, and we, his servants, will arise and build, but you have no portion or right or claim in Jerusalem. The response of the opposition here was immediate. It didn't take any time at all. God started moving and the opposition was right there. We can expect the same. And they were intent on first sowing doubt, attacking faith rather than flesh. They asked, are you rebelling against the king? Here the the opposers are trying to get Nehemiah and the people of Jerusalem to shift their focus, to shift their new, renewed paradigm away from the promises of God and back to the standards and expectations of the world around them. These are the same standard, the worldly expectations uh, are the things that the people of Israel have been worried about, uh, you know, for all these years. The things that had kept them from realizing the potential work that God had for them in their city. Nehemiah, if you look at his language, he he doesn't only give a bold reply, 
But it's not a defensive reply. If you look at his language, this is assertive language. Nehemiah is not on the defensive. He's still on the offensive. Meaning that he didn't, he didn't take this as a blow. He didn't take this as, oh, he didn't take one step back when not one single seed of doubt was planted uh, by, these, by, these, uh, by these men who were laughing and, and, and throwing these comments out at Nehemiah. And I said it was important earlier uh, because that the, that the opposition, they didn't understand the true nature and mission and who had sent uh, Nehemiah and the power with which he was coming. They didn't understand the power of God. And it's interesting because two of these men, Sambalat and Tobiah, have ties back to Jewish families. They have gene- genealogical ties to the Jewish people. And, and it's likely that all three of these men being uh, in the surrounding countries around there and being powerful men could have even owned property in and around the city. They could have even had business interests there. We don't know that for sure, uh, but it is definitely a possibility. But what does Nehemiah say? You will have no part or claim in Jerusalem. But it's not so much the the genealogical stuff. It's not so much their their business arrangements uh, that would have cause them to be separated from God's plan. It's the heart that, of these men that is causing them to be separated from the true Jerusalem and from the benefits and the, and the blessings of God's plan and the true family of God. And so you see the, the effect here uh, that it also it makes their, their opposition powerless. And, it, and quite the opposite makes Nehemiah's uh, efforts and the people of Jerusalem's efforts, now that they have turned their hearts back to God, uh, all the more powerful. So, and that take, that's the end of, of chapter two, but there's a couple of the, I have about four takeaways for us uh, from this passage. The first one being that a foundation of faith in the word and in the promises and the character of God is critical to knowing and acting in accordance with God's plan. We see this from the very beginning, right? Uh, Nehemiah, had, he's standing upon a firm foundation of faith. Nehemiah uh, didn't just decide at the beginning of this story, hey, you know what, I'm a, I'm a Jewish guy. My people have a covenant from God. I should look into that. No, he's coming from a foundation of faith in the word and the promises and the character of God. We can see this in the way and the words uh, that he prayed in chapter 1. Our hope for the new Jerusalem is from the heart which has been completely given to Christ and that has been bought with his own blood. The second takeaway here is in order to effectively engage in the work of God, we must then be willing to inspect and see what the world will tell us is not worth looking at, not worth the time. We have to be able to understand that what is worth the time of God or worth the time and attention of Christ, is not what the world thinks is worth the time and attention of their day. Nehemiah did it. Jesus did it. We should do it as a church. Number three uh, kind of speaks for itself, but response to God comes both individually and corporately amongst believers. We respond to God. You see this in Nehemiah. He responded individually when he received, uh, personally when he received the report from his brother. But you also saw the communal response of the people when he told them about what God was doing and how he was moving. Our response to God can occur both individually and corporately. Uh, We as a church can respond to God's call here in Stafford. We can respond to God's call in our lives as well. And the fourth is that opposition, no matter the form, does not stop God's plan. It will, but it will nonetheless try its hardest to discourage God's people to, to accept, or discourage God's, God's people so that they accept a status quo and perfect the art of getting by. Nothing, uh, nothing pleases Satan more than a lukewarm faith, and we know that nothing detests Christ more than a lukewarm faith. Nothing can be more ineffective to carrying out God's plan uh, than a Christian who has perfected the art of getting by. Right? We hear Nehemiah, he stands up to, and, and before the people and he tells them about God and his work and his plan. He doesn't try to play the hero as himself. He tells them, hey, this is what God is doing. And the people shift their hearts to God and then stuff, all of this stuff starts happening uh, in chapter 3. 
So those are my four uh, takeaways uh, from Nehemiah chapter 2. And then now, uh, next week, we're going to enter into the actual rebuilding, the physical rebuilding project. And we're going to see how not only the physical rebuilding project uh, progresses, but how that also has an impact in the people of the kingdom of Israel and also in the opposition uh, that are trying to, to stop them. So please pray with me and uh, the worship team come back up and lead us out. Lord God, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for your promises and your word and your faithfulness to your people, even when we are not faithful to you. Lord, we thank you so much for your word from Nehemiah that we can look to and be encouraged by knowing that if we are to turn, if we turn our hearts to you, when we turn our focus upon you, then you will move. Lord, I pray that you would give us the faith to be able to enter into uh, a relationship with you that is not governed by parameters that we set for ourselves. Nehemiah didn't know that he was going into a 40-day plan. He didn't know if his answer would be, if your answer would come on day 1, 2, 30, he did, or 39. He didn't know, but he kept praying. And then after that, he didn't know what Artaxerxes would say but he requested it anyways. He didn't know what would happen on the journey, but he went anyways. And he didn't know how your people would respond, but he, t- he addressed them anyways. Lord God, despite the opposition that we might uh, come up to against in this world, Lord, we know that you have already conquered it. We know that your plan will not be stopped by any opposition or any inhibition of our own. Lord, I pray that you would encourage us, encourage us greatly, uh, to, to get with you. If we don't know you personally, Lord, today, I pray that that would be our first step. For those of us that do know you, Lord, I pray that we would be encouraged uh, by this word to get involved in your plan, get involved in the work that you have for your people in this town, on this base, in our schools, and around this world, Lord God. Your gospel is on the move, Lord, and it is powerful to save and is powerful to reconcile all things to you. And we want to be a part of your plan, Lord God. And I pray, I thank you so much for allowing us to be, Lord. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen.